Wow. Good afternoon, great educators. Trust you all are as excited as I am to be here. Yes. The long-awaited second part of the webinar series for African education is here. And I know we can't wait to hear what these amazing and passionate educators in the presence of Lexolala from South Africa and Tiamato from Nigeria have in store for us. Once again, welcome. My name is Chinwe Eze and I will be your host today. With me are Susan and Toby, the more directors and other members of the MKB consulting who are poised to interact with you in the chat room. Do well to tell us your name, your location, and the name of your school, of course, because we would like to connect with you after the webinar. Once again, welcome. Please do not forget to drop your questions in the comment section as well. And all of that will be attended to. Well, welcome to Google for Education's Emerging Trends webinar series. It's really, really great to have you join us this afternoon uh, from wherever you're watching out in Africa and, and the rest of the world. Thank you for joining us. It's good to have you. Today's session is based on life skills and workforce preparation. We're going to look at entrepreneurial project-based learning approach to education and a deep dive into what is a relevant education in the 21st century. Today, I'm joined by Sia Wato. Sia is the director of Busy Bee's Early Year School. We also have the content developers of this course, Shalana Sturges and Barbara Brand. Uh, they're both on the chat and, and would really love to engage with you. So please pop them a message and say hello. My name is Lester Lulla, and I'm the, the headmaster of St. John's Preparatory School here in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's good to have you. I'm really passionate about the merging of a values-based education with relevant approaches and pedagogy to education. After all, we, we're preparing our young people for a very complex world, and so our teaching needs to reflect the complexity, the aspiration of the world that our young people are yet to inhabit. And so be, before we have a deep dive this afternoon, I just want to acknowledge our partners who are working with Google for Education and the series. Thank you to Open Networks for the curriculum development and organization. Thank you, Snaplify Education, for making the session available to your teacher networks. And a big thank you to MKB Consulting a Google for Education partner in Nigeria. The MKB COK is working with each presenter and helping boost the series to reach more teachers across Africa. And a, a massive thank you to Google for Education for making the series possible. Really, really important topics. So folks, this is session two of a 10 part series where we unpack the eight emerging trends in education. And if you're keen to understand and, and read about this more, I encourage you to get along to the Future of Classrooms report and have a look at the incredible work that Google is doing in this space. So as we mentioned, today's focus is life skills and workforce preparation. And as a headmaster of a, a preparatory school, this is really important to me. So let's have a, a deep dive into the factors behind this emerging trend in education. As humans, we, we continue to evolve and, and our roles in society are changing. Greater interdependence and a more globalized world has brought to light the importance of emotional intelligence. Each of us want to feel valued and supported. Emotional intelligence is, is not innate. In fact, it is a soft skill that can be developed. And I think this is really great news, that emotional intelligence can be taught. We need to teach our learners that they have a voice 
and that they can contribute value. Increasing global inequality means the world is desperate for empathetic leadership. And by empowering our youth with soft skills, we are investing in a kinder future. It's unfortunate that these are often relegated to the periphery of an education. And more and more as school leadership, as teachers, as educators, we need to realize that these critical soft skills need to be brought to the center of what we're doing. So this need for skills is not limited to education alone. 91% of CEOs globally say that they need to strengthen their organization's soft skills to sit alongside their digital skills. Healthy organization is not just about technical skills, it's about soft skills as well. And if you are happy with who you are, and if you feel empowered with self-love, you're able to work more efficiently Workers with a strong soft skills and are self-motivated, have stronger leadership skills and more capacity to invest in others and develop innovative solutions. And that's what our continent needs and that's what our world needs is innovative solutions to the many, many problems we face. And so folks, most curricular models and school timetables do not facilitate teaching soft skills and workforce preparation. There is historic focus on traditional learning areas like maths and literature and science. But I often think about this um, in the metaphor of, of a rainforest. Uh, the roots speak to the conditions for learning, a warm relationships, good routines, the good pedagogy. Uh, the trunk speaks to the knowledge structure and the skills that we are trying to develop in, in our young people. And, and then the canopy, the lush green canopy with, with fresh green shoots speaks to the creativity, the empathy, the, the future skill set that we want our, our students to develop. And so as we go through this webinar, just keep in mind, the, these are not binaries, but they're absolutely part and parcel of a well-developed future fit curriculum and approach to education. And so if we're teaching children to be articulate, critical thinkers with empathetic hearts and effective collaborators. Imagine the dynamic change we would see, not just in our classrooms, but in the world. Self-confidence is born from positive feedback and nurturing environments. Adulthood is not synonymous with purpose and confidence. And I think as adults, we know that too well. We know that when an effect, when we lack self-belief, uh, and self-confidence. It, it has a dire effect on our own psyches. Many of us have experienced a lack of soft skill development and need to work on ourselves so that we can better equip the children of the future. Everyone needs to be able to articulate ideas in written and verbal form. Presentation skills go far beyond the class oral. The modern workforce and technology means at some point in one's career, you'll be required to design high quality presentations and reports. And the computer is the new workforce assistant. And <laughs> we know that really, really well in this COVID world in which we live. And so again, we all witness teamwork go wrong and work incredibly well. Working with others is another skill that is not innate. But once again, as, as social beings, this can be taught. Technology is driving change across the world. Uh, Google Arts and Culture is an amazing repository on the history of human invention. Here on the slide, you can see the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, USA. In this museum, you will be able to see the multiple iterations of computer technology over the years, from massive rooms that could process a couple of megabytes to the modern cell phone that can hold gigabytes of data at a time. <laughs> it's crazy to think, folks, that we used to keep information in a floppy disk. I certainly have fond childhood memories of that. But now we live in an era where cloud-based storage solutions are our everyday reality. The computer started off from the invention of an abacus created to solve complex calculations. The abacus processed one step further to become the calculator where calculations could be performed automatically. And so this idea of automation, computer automation, has radically changed the world in which we live. 
Robotic technology allows us to explore Mars and replace factory workers. We are all reliant on being globally connected through technology. We listen to music from smart devices. We read books on devices. We communicate through cell phone networks and we source information in seconds from across, across this globally connected world. And if you look at some of the jobs that we currently have in our markets and wind the clock back just a mere 10 years ago, you will see that most of these jobs did not exist. We now have data analysts who help us to understand trends and movements, content creators, online rental platforms, app developers, driverless car engineers, and social media managers who are facilitating our online presence to keep us globally connector, connected. In many senses, folks, it, it's a new world in which we live compared to just 10 years ago. And yet, if we look at many of our classrooms, they have sadly not changed. They remain what we call the factory model classroom, uh, the endless rows of desks where teachers stand at the front of the classroom talking at the learners. Um, our students then memorize and, and regurgitate the facts that they are learning because that is what the curriculum says we must do. And how does this model help us to truly learn? And I guess the answer, as you know all too well, it doesn't. We have the internet available at the touch of a button to pull up a fact. So what we need is our learners to be able to think critically and independently. We don't need more, more knowledge. We live in a knowledge-rich information uh, era. What we do need, though, is our learners who are, are thinking critically about what they learn, who are curious about wanting to know more, and are passionate about engaging knowledge in a very relevant and meaningful way. And so cross-disciplinary workflows are, are happening everywhere. Winning sports teams have team psychologists, a technique coach, and transportation experts. That's a, a very different specialist team to 20 years ago. Dr. Hannah Dumont, an educational psychologist and in research in international education, says that addressing a problem from different disciplinary perspectives is important. This is not only what students need to do when they enter the workforce. This is what we need to solve the big problems that we face, like climate change. Interdisciplinary cross workflows, absolutely necessary. We all know that our classrooms and in life, we are not the same people. We have musicians, dreamers, actors, sportsmen, analysts, and the list goes on and on. We need to respect differences and have a curriculum that caters for growing these multiple intelligences. If we are able to use each person's strength to move forward, imagine what an inclusive and fair world we would live in. This, colleagues, is the goal. And so, in summary, the main changes we are seeing in education are a more globalized workforce. With cloud computing, people can work from anywhere and cross geographical divides with a video call, much like what we're doing today. Cross-continent teams are more prevalent and work requires cross-disciplinary focus. We see architects focusing on medical product design and many more cross-functional job descriptions. Intelligence is defined more broadly with greater value on other types of intelligence over and above just being book smart. New education models value spatial awareness, intrapersonal skills, musical and kinesthetic ability, and more. And lastly, there is a shift to teaching students problem-solving skills in conjunction with traditional testing of knowledge memorization. It's not binary. We need both of these aspects. And so I'm going to hand you over to Sia, my co-presenter. And Sia will show you some examples of this new education model in action. Sia, over to you. Thank you so much, Lassiter. It's so exciting to see all the global changes affecting education today. Teachers around the world are changing the way they teach. This shouldn't be any different for education in Africa. 
project-based learning is one of the best models for teaching knowledge, soft skills, and problem solving. Let's have a look at how Matt, a chemistry teacher, taught his students entrepreneurship with project-based learning. I got into science when I was about 15 years old. In the middle of the night, I got up, took out this little toy telescope. I could actually see the lines in Jupiter, just like you'd see in a book. It blew my mind. I've kind of followed science ever since. This room smells like no other classroom on the planet. I used to be a very traditional chemistry teacher, but I moved into project-based learning. It is a lot more work, but it feels good. I created a project, the Wicked Soap Company. The students learn about making soap. They learn about neutralization reactions. We learn about the pH scale. It's that iterative process, the physical act of making the soap, where you're mixing up the oils, mixing up the lye. It's analyzing your results and seeing what worked and what didn't, and trying it again in hopes of improving it. We're able to work on documents together and all collaborate. We've been able to learn more business strategies to be able to get our name out there. Every bit of money that we get, we either put back into the company or give back to the community. We've given away soap to organizations in need. We've given away scholarships to students that really need it. Matt teaches chemistry his own way. It's nothing like any other class I've been in. I'm inspired when I see students have that light bulb turn on. They're into it. I'm Matt Martin, and I teach 10th grade chemistry. Thank you, Google for Education. Um, thank you, Matt, for being such a fun teacher. Who wouldn't want to be in a project-based learning environment? Making soap while learning is fun. In the film, we witnessed how students' core knowledge of science grew alongside their group work and entrepreneurship skills. Soap making requires strong chemistry um, knowledge of acids and bases. I'm sure the formal assessments um, of the children were, uh, or the students were successful because of the hard work um, and so much work that had been done on practically testing the theory. The profits from the soap were used to fund student scholarship, like they mentioned. Um, it was used to purchase a wheelchair and care for the homeless. The students in that process develop empathy and care for others throughout their learning journey. We also see um, how Matt is still teaching the students core principles of science. Students need base knowledge to succeed with project-based um, learning. The teachers build the students' knowledge with research activities or a class presentation, or they pre-record videos, um, video instructions. Um, part of the lesson time is also dedicated to practical application as with soap making or even uploading a video online. There are a host of videos on YouTube or you can record your own video with online tools such as um, Google Meet. The ability to use um, technology to be productive um, is a critical work skill for the future. Throughout the video, we, we see devices being used in the science lessons. The integration of technology and traditional learning areas like science is now becoming seamless. Google Workspace for Education is a collaborative learning platform. It equips the learners with the tools that they need to collaboratively produce the company's logo, the packaging, or sales channel. Um, the collaborative lesson um, webinar will explore this functionality in more detail, so make sure you're signed up for that. With this project, students are upskilling their communication, entrepreneurship, and collaborative skills. The role of the teacher is quite different in project-based learning. Teachers and students collaborate together and give feedback to one another. Matt is constantly working with his learners, testing their recipes, assisting with science and entrepreneurship knowledge. With Matt's guidance and facilitation, students enthusiastically operate the Wicked Soap Company, which, give back, which, which gives back to the community. 
in an in, in this instance, um, well, in an instance when a community's member um, house burnt down, students donated all of their income from the next day to support this member. It hasn't been all uh, work and no fun for the Wicked Soap staff though. Students have gone on outings that they wouldn't have otherwise gone on. Essentially, Matt is the CEO of a student-led organization as well as their teacher. I'm going to hand over back now to Lester as we continue to show how we can set up project-based learning in your classroom. Sia, thank you. It really is great to see some amazing and inspiring examples of what teachers and, and students are doing. So folks, it, it might sound daunting to set up a, a student-led business or a project-based learning opportunity, but how do we need an elephant one bite at a time? And so we're going to look at some practical ways that you can get started. Project-based learning is about promoting curiosity and inspiring students to solve problems and ask difficult questions. A good question is often more valuable than a simple answer. And so as teachers, we are programmed to always be in control and to teach content and give our students the answers. But project-based learning can be difficult to implement because we don't have textbooks with the latest unsolved mysteries, and we don't have very neat packaged answers to give our students. So today we're going to share where you can find problems worth solving. It's important to select challenges within student zones of proximal development. This is a really critical principle. Choose something difficult enough that learners feel challenged, but also require some guidance. Break it into achievable mini projects that they can master with some level of independence. The key is to present challenges in an accessible manner without explaining away the mystery. We don't want students to become overwhelmed, but we do want them to become curious. Learners' curiosity is sparked by real-world challenges. Learning is much more exciting when the work you do has real value and isn't just an easy uh, tick box exercise or an essay only your teacher or maybe your parents will read. One of the best examples of students solving big problems is the Google Science Fair. Let's have an example. In, in 2015, 17-year-old Olivia Hallisey created a groundbreaking Ebola test and won the Google Science Fair. Olivia's Ebola test is made from silk and can confirm an Ebola infection in under 30 minutes with no refrigeration. The commitment to trial and error iteration that Olivia displays is absolutely amazing and her invention is truly life-saving. Olivia was inspired to work on the Ebola crisis because her teacher encouraged her to watch the news. Watching the news or keeping up with trends is a great way to find conversation starters for the classroom. News coverage sparks students' interest and creates a strong background knowledge. This makes facilitating problem solving much easier. It's part of the teacher's job in developing students' base knowledge and empathy is outsourced to the news channel. And so often this is about thinking differently, using the world around you as the learning context and not just following prescribed textbooks. As a busy teacher, and I'm one of those, it's hard to stay up to date with the news. But Google News makes it easier to find content related to specific interests. The tabs in the menu on the side allow you to follow different topics or regions and filter the stories. This makes finding important information easier and much more efficient. Huge thank you to Google News. The news is one place to find problems, but scaling existing solutions or reworking them with further constraints are also another great place to look. These types of problems are super accessible for students as there is tons of readily available research. For example, students at Stanford D School were asked to find a way to reduce the death toll for premature babies in underserved areas. An inability to monitor body temperature 
has already been identified as one of the main causes of death in premature babies. An incubator is a known solution, but it is costly and requires electricity and medical personnel. One of the teams came up with an amazing solution for a new type of sleeping bag style incubator. The warm embrace can be used by mothers and run without electricity. There is a paraffin wax pack that can be heated with boiling water and placed in the sleeping bag to keep the baby warm for four to six hours. The warm embrace is seamless, so you can easily sterilize it with boiling water and it costs less than $200. As you can see, folks, the solution is life-changing because it addresses challenges within an existing solution. In many ways, it's better than a traditional incubator as it allows mothers to hold their premature babies. Sometimes we think we need to find brand new problems that no one has ever explored before. But this is scary to teach and difficult for school children to solve. Remember the zone of proximal development. Taking an existing solution and redesigning the solution for a new context is a great way to build students' base knowledge, empathy, and develop critical thinking skills. The incubator story is so inspiring because it shows how thoughtful design actually saves lives. Lego award winner Anirudh Ganasan experienced the impact of a lack of vaccines as a baby and wanted to ensure other children and parents did not have the same pain points. Anirudh developed Vaxwagon, a pedal-powered vaccine refrigerator. His invention is an efficient re redesign of an existing solution in a resource-constrained environment. He used readily available materials like aircon gas and a pedal bike. Problems or pain points within students' local environments are accessible and fun to work on. For example, reducing litter on a hiking trail, Students are excited to solve problems that are personal to them. Choosing local challenges means students can interview the community to gain insights, as well as go exploring beyond the walls of the classroom. And how fun is that? Our students at the school that I teach were recently challenged to design and build a cost-effective dev device that could be deployed to rural communities to help children cross rivers safely. Many of our children have to get to school and across a river in the process. Sadly, many lives are lost through the year through children drowning. And so by creating a, a very authentic example, our students were able to come up with many, many amazing solutions. This is what true empathy is all about. Finding challenges that touch the heart is a great way to keep students inspired and willing to persevere through the difficulties of the design process. Empathy maps teach students to think deeply about others and how to create solutions that solve users' actual needs rather than perceived needs. Mapping the user experience gives students deeper insight into the problems they are trying to solve. Empathy maps match research with actual observations because our solutions must always have a user in mind and what a great way to develop empathy when you know that your solution is helping to truly change the life of somebody else. In an empathy map activity, the user is placed in the center and the students make notes on what the user thinks, feels, says or does. You also note what the user hears or sees. The students note pain points and gains as they observe the user. And the resource pack for the session is an empathy map template that you can use with your own students. In summary, project-based learning can be used in any subject and with any age. Students could advocate for something they believe, design a new product or process, or get fresh perspectives on literature by designing something for a character. Even preschoolers can design solutions to save their favorite fairy tale characters from pending disaster.
whether it be a dating app for Cinderella or an escape boat for the gingerbread man. That's a good one. High school students can work through more complex problem-based problem learning, challenges-based learning on the themes of their set books or other content that they are studying. I'm now going to hand you back to Sia as we look at some design thinking and how it helps students develop solutions. Sia, over to you. Thank you, Lester. It's often, um, we often think amazing ideas only happen to geniuses. The truth is everyone can learn to be innovative. Solution design is about thinking, um, learning how to think creatively and critically. Any student can be Anurag Ganeshan or Olivia Halise. They just need the right tools and design thinking is one of them. Dr. Frederick Ferd, Chief Innovation Evangelist at Google says that design thinking is an innovative problem solving methodology that's accessible to anyone and everyone. By empathizing with your users, practicing expansive thinking and experimenting with your ideas, you and your team can tap into your collective creative power. Dr. Fur breaks down the lie that only artists could be creative. Through our design thinking frameworks, students learn to be creative. They learn to be curious and to think like designers. Creative confidence builds as learners identify and test solutions. Design thinking removes the mental block that sometimes surface when we're asked to think of an idea. Design thinking helps with the first two stages of the innovation process. The first stage, idea generation, and the second stage, which is testing. The Google Rework team says that design thinking helps individuals build the skills that they need to effectively generate ideas and to test them out. Experimenting and reiterating designs um, design develops persistence and collaboration. Students learn that failure is an opportunity to generate new ideas. In design thinking, one should be biased towards testing ideas as quickly as possible rather than waiting for the ideal circumstance. The word design can be applied to so many contexts. So let's unpack some of the terminologies of design thinking. Design thinking is a way of thinking, again, that promotes creativity. That's a key word. You can say design thinking is a mindset that facilitates creativity and design. For example, being comfortable with ambiguity and failing forward are mindsets that foster innovation. We need innovation always. Design thinking is also a procedure or a framework. If you follow a design thinking model, it will give you step-by-step -step ways to create a design. Just like there are many different cars that perform all of the same function, which is um, transportation, there are many different design thinking frameworks you can use to create a design. Essentially, Design thinking frameworks focuses on discovery, idea generation, experimenting, and prototyping. Design thinking processes are cyclical. They go in a circle and with many reiteration at various steps. Design thinking process, um, a design is also um, another word for a product. So designs are the outcome of adopting design thinking mindsets and working through the various steps of a design process. So like I said before, there are many different um, ways to approach design thinking. In this instance, we are going to approach um, design thinking from Google's design thinking framework called a design sprint. Google has a site which is an open source for design leaders, product owners, developers, or anyone who is learning about or running design sprints. 
This site unpacks design sprints methodology and has lots of resources on how to run a design sprint. A sprint can be a five-day workshop where each day is devoted to a different procedure in the design sprint framework. Instead of doing math and English, the students would work on different phases of the design sprint. The link to Google's design sprint site is in the resource pack, but we will also unpack some of the activities in the session today. The five phases of a design sprint are mapping the problem to be solved, sketching potential solutions, deciding the best solution to build, prototyping a solution, and testing it with a user. We're gonna focus now on mapping, the value of defining a problem. Understand the challenge is key to solution development. You must understand the challenge. In this phase, core aspects of the problem and potential solutions are laid out. Lightning Talks are short presentations by different stakeholders that can be used to build um, designers' base knowledge of the topic. In a school context, you could have teachers, students, parents, or local experts presenting different key points for ensuring the design sprint. How might we statements? How might we statements are a way um, for mapping out our problems? How might we statements are a core method for articulating opportunities? In this activity, teams, um, Things are going through their user data on the problem and framing opportunities rather than solution. Each of the how might we statements should be recorded on a single post-it or a single page. Each word of the how might we phase puts the team members in the right mindset. The design sprint team at Google phrases this method as follow. How? How guides team members to believe the answer is out there? Might. Might lets the team members know that their how might we statement might or might not work, and either possibility is okay. We. We remind team members that the design sprint is about teamwork and building on each other's ideas. Do not spend a lot of time crafting or perfecting your statements. With as little self-editing as possible, encourage your team to come up with as many how might we statements as they can. This is an exercise in expansive thinking aimed at preventing the team from arriving at premature solutions. As an example, students could craft statements about how to make online learning more social or how learning could prepare students for the future the, st the statements all revolve around a specific problem a team seeks to solve. Once you've created all the how might we statements, it's best to group them. Affinity mapping is a great tool for this. In this phase, the first three people read out the statements and then they start creating categories. Each person reads their how might we statements and then, they, and then the statements are added into categories. The team can draft new statements as the activity progresses. At the end, all the statements will be grouped together. This makes it easier for the team to identify the opportunity they want to solve or they want a solution to focus on. Jamboard is also another useful um, tool you can make all your how might we statements on sticky notes using Jamboard. You can then read through the statements and group them into categories using colors and moving the sticky notes on Jamboard. In this challenge, there are how might we statements about making online more social. We group all the how might we statements that link to body language together. And then we link individual attention in the group video call together. I'll be calling upon Joseph at the end of this session to show us um, um, a demo on using Jamboard for How My Week statements. 
sketching. Sketching helps the team plan ideas and walk through different elements of a solution. It is important to sketch things out as it shows new insights into solving the problem. Pushing through the first idea clears the brain fog and gets the creative juices awake. A fun sketching activity is Crazy Eights. With Crazy Eights, a piece of paper is divided into eight blocks, as you can see up there. The team sketches eight ideas in eight minutes. Remember, the sketches do not have to be masterpieces. The main idea of this activity is placing the different elements of the solution in a visual way. Decide, what is the decision phase? It's now time to decide which idea is best suited to be tested. These ideas represent different hypotheses to be evaluated. In this stage, a number of strong solutions would have been developed by the team. Deciding which idea should be tested first requires a commitment to teamwork and humility. Students learn interpersonal skills as they listen to each other's ideas. Silent review and dot vote. Silent review and dot vote is a helpful design sprint method for a team that usually gives the greatest decision-making power to the loudest person in the room. This alternative exercise gives each team member a more equal voice. In this activity, the sketches are hung on the wall. Everyone has five minutes to review the sketches. The facilitator then leads a discussion of each sketch Three minutes per sketch keeps the conversation concise. The problem is then reviewed and the voting criteria is set. Each team member gets to place three sticker dots as presentations, as representations of their votes. The sketch with the most dots is the solution to be prototyped, not the person with the loudest voice. A prototype is a rough model of how the solution should look. Prototyping allows, um, allows you to experiment the hypothesis. Prototypes make you think critically about what you will build and how to get the feedback you need to evaluate your hypothesis or not. Anything can be prototyped in a day if it's clearly mapped out. We can achieve so much with, um, with, with, with a prepared environment, teachers. The important thing to do is to get the prototype space organized beforehand so that the lesson time is not spent looking for materials. A group of refugees wanted to recreate some of the challenges of the Syrian war to enable aid organizations understand their needs better. They thought an immersive virtual reality experience was the best solution, but they only had a video in the first instance. They play the video under a black bag to create an immersive world. This sample prototype was a success and funding was released for development. So here is a sample of prototyping. Prototypes can be created with simple materials like a stencil and paint. It could also be created with a garbage bag. These students were tested with, uh, were tasked with creating African fashion garments. Some students tested their designs um, with digital layering of images, while others created stencils for printing. This instance shows how prototyping can be high or low tech. The aim for creating a prototype is to test out the concept and identify further challenges um, or design changes. When designing a product like an app, you want to visualize the user experience. The prototype shows what happens as different information is imputed into the application. It doesn't have to be a coded solution. You can simply recreate the user's journey using hyperlinks or paper sketches. For example, you can use Google Slides or drawings to hyperlink different buttons 
And this would create the experience of clicking through an application without extensive time spent on coding the application. Here you can see a restaurant app designed with images and hyperlink shapes in Google's drawings. An invisible shape is placed over the donut and hyperlinked to the next drawing. When you click on, it takes you to the next screen of the app. The Grow with Google site has a short course on user experience. There you'll hear from experts and see the value of the UX design in practice. The link to this course is in the resource pack and will be shared at the end of this session. And also it will be shared on site tomorrow. I'm going to move on now to something very important and that's feedback. Getting feedback from users early in the solution development process helps designers fix important issues. Testing the prototype with actual users gives the students feedback on their process. It highlights key areas to change or improve. You can set up user interviews via Google Meet or in person. As teachers, we should be uh, we should also role play different user journeys in our classrooms. But the key point here is that we have to interview actual users. A great model for prototype testing is the five act interview. In this interview, the prototype should be the focus rather than talking them through your idea for the majority of the time. Setting up the interview questions and structure is a good way to give constructive feedback. You can start with a friendly welcome, then some context questions. You can introduce the prototype. You give the user one or two tasks to test on the prototype. And then finally, a quick debrief where you find out more about the problem and how they experience the solution. Design thinking and project-based learning celebrates the process as much as, final, as much as the final product. You may find that the prototypes fall into different categories. An efficient failure, a flawed success, and an epic win. With an efficient failure, the prototypes don't hit the mark, but it's important to know that the students learn something or many things that can, that can save the team from months and months of work building the wrong product. When you experience an efficient failure, you might want to um, run a follow-up sprint. A flawed success. With a flawed success, some of the ideas meet the user's need, but not all do. The students learn something and can now reiterate and test again. With an epic win, the concept meets the, the, the user's needs and they are able to complete the task easily and are engaged with all the features the team has mapped out. When you experience an epic win, you are ready to implement. Once all the user interview data has been gathered, you can go back and refine the product. It is important to celebrate all progress and milestones achieved. The Sprint Master should acknowledge all of the hard work and celebrate the students or the team's achievement. A closing circle is a nice way to bring everyone together. Here you can ask people to share their insights about what they'll take away from the experience and give people some sense of accomplishment with the project. Perhaps too, you can start discussing what problems you want to tackle next. next. We're now going to hear from Lester on using design thinking to set up entrepreneurship projects. So yeah, thank you. That was a really great deep dive into the design process. There are so many activities uh, to teach learners and to be more creative. Design thinking is used around the world in product design. So let's have a look at how students can use it to create their own businesses. Google designers double down on the idea that your physical surroundings affect your well-being. The vice president of hardware design, Ivy Ross, says that we champion thoughtful design. I quite like that phrase. Thinking about how something feels 
not just how it looks. Ross describes the product development process as working out what it means to hold Google in your hand. Ross and her team released a spate of new and updated hardware that blend seamlessly into domestic spaces. A Pixel Book laptop with hush keys for softer typing, the Nest Wi-Fi and mini devices in an updated palette of pastel fabrics, and return to Milan Design Week for an exhibition on neuroaesthetics, the field of exploring how design impacts our biology and emotions. Product design is such a big part of product development. Problem solving is a core skill in the information rich job market, but it's also pivotal to building student independence. We have discussed the first two phases of building a business in detail. You start with the field you would like the products to be in and build a product with design thinking. This is the problem solving phase of business development. Once you have the product, you can start creating marketing content like a logo. The next step is setting up sales channel, like a school market day or an online store. To develop students' empathy, encourage them to raise money for charity. Lastly, share your business with the world via social media or parent communities or the larger community. Project-based learning is more about the learning process than the final outcome, and that's a really important principle. Some students struggle with finishing the project, but their growth in thinking is clearly evident throughout the entire process. Assessing students on their process work gives these students an opportunity to shine. You can assess a student's process by asking the following questions. How did a student develop the idea? What prior knowledge was demonstrated in the idea development? What range of research was covered in developing the solution? Here's an example of a student's reflection on the logo design process. You can see the evidence of learning. All aspects of the project were documented in a research journal on Google Slides. You can also assess, assess students' design techniques and the quality of the solution. What range of techniques were used to create the prototype? How competent is the prototype? How effective was the solution? What process did the student use to evaluate and refine the solution? Does the solution fit the problem? A really key principle. So here's an example of the finished logo. Setting up an online store is easy with Google Sites. Here you can see students' products displayed together with different tabs telling you about their business. What an amazing output for 12 to 13 year olds. Our children are very capable. We just need to give them the opportunity. Now that you have seen what types of activities you can do, let's look at who a project-based learning teacher is. A design thinking facilitator is first and foremost an explorer, someone who can step back from the details and ask big questions, someone who is curious and consistently seeks out the unknown and who is a lifelong learner. Someone who questions facts and humbly admits gaps in knowledge, inviting guest speakers to share mysteries that are trying to solve can make students and teachers excited about exploration. Talking through emotions and practicing expansive thinking embraces uncertainty rather than rushing to resolution. And as teachers, sometimes we're too quick to get to resolution. A gardener is an apt description of a design thinking teacher. One has to cultivate a tolerance for risk taking and provide the ingredients for growth. Design thinking teachers work alongside students as a coach. A coach assembles teams and teaches pupils to seek constructive criticism rather than praise. Students learn to prevent premature closure and consistently ask, how can my design be better? Interestingly, design thinking processes help low achievers the most as they learn how to close the gaps in knowledge, improve their metacognition and develop new skills. And that for me is a real big win. 
Being a storyteller inspires learners to dream big and unlock their imaginations. Design thinkers know that everyone is creative and failure is not the end of the road. One of the primary roles of the design thinking facilitator is being the judge. There are various stages in the design thinking process that requires a decider to set the direction and help the team pivot or proceed. At some point, a design thinking teacher is a listening ear, arbitrator, and other moments, the ultimate decision maker. My staff and I often joke about us being the middler in the middle. As you can see, a project design teacher has many hats to wear and needs to fulfill these roles with grace and adaptability. A design thinking challenge is a very different way of structuring learning. Clear communication with school management, co-teachers, parents and learners ensures that the change is celebrated and supported. You can motivate key stakeholders by sharing stories of successful design sprints and learning gains. In certain districts, school leaders have undertaken an empathy day. This allows school leaders to observe pupils for a day and see some of the challenges they face firsthand. Empathy days are perfect for creating more pupil-centered learning environments. Another strategy for getting parents on board is including them in the design sprints. Parents can assist with providing real-world context or expert information. One of the easiest ways to keep everyone informed is to set up project-based learning site. Here's an example of a site created by a teacher in South Africa. Students spent six months setting up an African fashion business that raised money for charity. There was a short one-minute video explaining the project. The project was based on the venture capital Dragon's Den. Students created their own textile designs and fashion items, which they sold to raise money for charity. Throughout the project, small amounts of funding were available based on various tasks, such as the logo design, business plan, presentations, and site design. The project was run by a team of teachers and support from school management and parent communities. We're going to hand you back to Sia as she sums up how to assess project-based learning. Sia, over to you. Thank you, Lester. Assessing project-based learning. Tick marking a worksheet looks very different in project-based learning. Assessments is such a big part of teaching. Teachers usually struggle between assessing for learning and assessing for reporting. In this instance, assessing for learning is key. It's important to begin with the end in mind, knowing that project-based learning is a journey that exposes your students to unpredictable real-life scenarios. As your teachers experience these scenarios, it's only natural that they will begin to self-assess themselves even better. Feedback is one of the most important ways to improve student learning. Students need specific ongoing feedback in project-based learning. Setting goal goals with the students help them to work out the next steps and improve the project in achievable stages. Feedback should be given throughout the project and not just at the end of the project. Feedback doesn't always have to be formal. You can make a funny video comment as a feedback on your student's presentation, or you could just give them a simple sticker. Teaching students to critique their own work improves metacognition. metacognition um, metacognitive activities help students develop core skills such as goal-oriented planning, successful study strategies, curiosity, resilience, and they get to gain deeper awareness that is usually above the subject matter, thereby increasing their ability to adapt their learning. Basically, they become better critical thinkers naturally. Providing students with rubrics such as this teaches them critical thinking too. They can assess their projects as, they, as the work progresses. In the resource pack, we have three self-assessment forms you can copy. The forms can be used for logos, research work, and prototypes. 
You can use the um, you can use the rubric to grade your students. However, whenever you have the opportunity, you should give the students the opportunity to self-assess their own work. We look forward to seeing you throughout this webinar series as we plan to show you um, how to grade with forms even more. Thank you again for joining us today. At this point in time, I'm going to hand over to um, Joseph, who will take um, who will take us through the demo session. I'm Sia, director, Busy Bee Early Years School, and the lead consultant at Busy Bee Consult. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much, Sia. So, sticky notes can be used to the Jamboard using sticky notes can be used to generate how my three statements quickly by team members. The main challenge or problem is placed in the frame using a sticky note. Then each team member enters one or more how my three statements, depending on the size of the team that will serve as an opportunity for a possible solution. Now, to, for team members to enter their high matrix statement, you just click on the sticky note. You can change the background color from here. The default background color is yellow. So the team members will enter their high matrix statement and click save. Then place the high matrix statement in a proper place. So once every team member has entered an RMI3 statement, a team member reads the RMI3 statement and the team agrees and groups the RMI3 statement into categories like communication, attention, feelings, and commendation by changing the background color of the sticky note. To change the background color of the sticky note, just click on the sticky note, go to more, or actions, click on edit, then change the background color of the sticky note, click on save. So in that way, the team will group all the my 3 statements, just as you can see on the screen, into different categories. Once the team is done with marking and grouping the my 3 statement, the team moves on to plan ideas and walk through the different elements of a possible solution. So this is how you can use the Jamboard with a sticky note to create a matrix statement by team members that will help solve a problem like this one that we have here. How could we host an online lesson that is more social and full of learning? Thank you very much, Lisa, uh, Sia, over to you. Thank you very much, Joseph. I think at this point in time, we will take um, any questions and answer. Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm going to, yes, hand over to Lester as we take any questions. Unmute, please. Unmute. Wow. What an insightful section that was. Yes. Google for Education understands that we are living in a project-based world, hence the need for this topic. As teachers, we need to prepare the children for the real world. Yes. We need to prepare them to be, um, to be creative, we need to prepare them to be self-sufficient. We need, to, we need to prepare them to be critical thinkers so that they will be able to do what? Face any challenge that may come their way. Yes, I know you got value as much as I did. I would like to hear your feedback. I would like to hear your story 
Once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. Thank you, Lester. Thank you, Sia, for doing a beautiful job. Also, thank you, the moderators, Susan and Toby, for doing an amazing job as well. But before I draw this cut into a close, I would like to invite us to the third part of this series, which will be coming up in three weeks' time. Yes, this webinar will be bringing the computational thinking to your school by Google for Education. And you don't want to miss this opportunity of teaching your children how to 